Okay, today we are going to talk about uh, another important uh, multi-user communication uh, model, which is called the broadcast channel. And in particular, we are going to look at a new coding technique called superposition coding, uh, which turns out to be optimal for a class of uh, broadcast channels and has also some uh, implications in uh, modern system design. Uh, so we are going to talk about today two user broadcast channel, uh, introduce superposition coding, uh, introduce the class of broadcast channels for which uh, superposition coding is optimal. Uh, it turns out that the important uh, Gaussian case belongs to this class, so we are going to generalize uh, the results to the Gaussian case and uh, to the K user case and then some notes about uh, other classes of uh, uh, broadcast channels uh, for which superposition coding is also optimal but they are less uh, maybe less uh, encountered in practice uh, and we conclude so what is the broadcast channel well essentially uh, it is like the Mac flipped around. So we have one transmitter and uh, in the case of two users, two receivers. The transmitter has uh, in general three messages to deliver, one common message, M0, that has to be delivered to both users, and then two private messages, uh, M1 and M2, where message M1 is desired only by user 1 and message M2 is desired only by user 2. Um, you may think, for example, as the downlink of a cellular system where the transmitter is the base station, right, ta, 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 and then we have two users, right? Uh, and so the base station has just one radio channel to use to communicate to these two users. And of course, there are several practical uh, schemes that uh, do this. For example, time division. We can send say, one packet here at uh, some time slots and then one packet here at uh, some time slots. Frequency division. Uh, we can allocate uh, sub-channels to the two users on different frequencies. But in general, as we will see, these are not optimal strategies. So, of course, as usual in information theory, we are interested about the capacity region. Uh, so, some definitions. A code for the broadcast channel with rates R0, R1, R2 and block length N consists of uh, three index sets. We have one index set for message 0, one index set for message 1, one index set for message 2. An encoding function that maps a triple of messages M1, uh, M0, M1, M2 into uh, code words. Code words are sequences of length n out of the input alphabet of the channel X. And two decoding functions, one dec decoder at user 1, G1, that maps the output of user 1, which is Y1n, into a decision on message 0 and message 1 and a decoding function g2 at user 2 that does the same thing for user 2. And um, we define the probability of error for such code as the probability of the union of events that uh, user 1 makes an error or user 2 makes an error. Or means doesn't mean XOR, uh, it's union, so we are interested in, uh, if you want, the converse or, or the, the complement of the event that both users make the correct decision. So the capacity region is the closure of all triples of uh, rates R0, R1, R2, for which there exists a sequence of codes of in rate R0, R1, R2, and probability of error that vanish to zero as the block length goes to infinity. So that's the usual, the usual uh, 
uh, setup, information theoretic setup. So a first consideration is in the role of the joint conditional uh, distribution that governs the, the channel, so in particular P Y1 comma Y2 given X, right? Um, and we find through a very simple argument that in fact the capacity region depends only on the two conditional marginals, which are P Y1 given X and P Y2 given X. Notice that for given uh, marginals, P Y1 given X, P Y2 given X, there exists, uh, in fact, a lot of different, in fact, as many as you want, different uh, uh, joint conditional distributions. In particular, there is one for which the Y1 and Y2 are conditionally independent. So it's the case P Y1, Y2 given X equal to the product of the marginals, but that's not, of course, the unique, uh, the, the only possibility. You have a whole set of possible joint distributions, okay, for which those are the marginals. So given this lemma that, uh, given this lemma 22, the capacity region depends only on the marginal distributions, it means that, um, in fact, there exists a whole equivalence class of broadcast channels with the same capacity region as long as the the marginal distributions are fixed okay so we can go from the case where y1 and y2 are strongly dependent given x to the case where y1 and y2 are completely independent given x which is uh, this case huh? um, and as long as the two marginals are fixed the capacity region will be the same so these also gives us a, a degree of freedom in studying the capacity region because it means that among all this class we can choose depending on uh, what we want to prove we can choose the most convenient member of the class and if we prove a result for example a converse for that member is automatically uh, extends to the whole class because the capacity region is independent uh, of the joint conditional distribution, but only on the margin. So how do we show this? As the argument is relatively simple. But first of all, we notice that uh, decoder 1 operates only on Y1. So, it, you know, we have here a channel, right, somehow, we have a channel for decoder 1 where whatever distribution of y2 given x uh, is, uh, is irrelevant to decoder 1. And the same thing happens for, of course, decoder 2. So the, probab the individual probability of error is only a function of the conditional marginal distribution, individual. Okay? But we have defined capacity region in terms of the probability of error that both, uh, so both decoder have to, to make a correct decision. So it turns out that uh, defining the individual probability of error as the probability that uh, decoder K makes an error in its decision then we have that uh, the probability of error that we have defined before is, of course, greater or equal than the maximum of the two, because the probability of the union is always greater or equal than the maximum of the probability of the events, but is, by the union bound, less or equal than the sum of the probabilities. So here we see that if PE goes to zero, then the maximum of the two individual probabilities also go to zero, but vice versa, if both 
PE1 and PE2 goes to zero, then by the union bound, this implies that uh, PE goes to zero. So this means that since these two depends only on the marginal distributions, whatever rate pairs make these two, uh, for, so for whatever rate pairs uh, admits, you know, a, a sequence of codes for which uh, uh, the, the, these two error probability goes to zero, then, then this means that, uh, well, these, these uh, rate, I say rate pair, it should be rate triple, um, um, is automatically achievable because then the probability of error goes to zero and vice versa, whatever triple of rates is achievable, so for which this goes to zero, then uh, uh, this implies that also the individual probability of, of error will go to zero. So the two regions uh, define in terms of the global probability of error or the individual probability of errors coincide. And uh, uh, since uh, the individual probability of errors depend only on the marginal distribution, we conclude that the um, probability that uh, the, the, the capacity region depends only on the margins. Okay. So this is an important point that we will uh, exploit at some point in the proof of the converse for the, for the class of broadcast channels uh, that we are going to treat more in this, in this chapter. So interestingly, while for the multi-access channel we pretty much know everything, so the capacity region is determined pretty much in the most general possible case, uh, the capacity region of a general discrete memorous broadcast channel, even for the two user case, is still an open problem, perhaps one of the most relevant and long-standing problems in information theory. So in the full generality, even for the discrete memorous channel, uh, memorous case, uh, the capacity region is uh, uh, not fully known. Say unknown is really not, not true because we know a lot of things and we know a lot of classes of channels for which either the capacity region is exactly known or it is known up to very good approximation of uh, upper and lower bounds that come very close. But the general result is not uh, is not there yet, so it's an open problem. So let's start discussing some simple cases, and then we will dig into uh, general coding technique that is able to achieve the capacity region for uh, large classes of broadcast channels. So the first case is where there is only the common message. So this sometimes is called the multicast capacity because multicasting means uh, distributing the same message to many users. So in this case, the result is very simple because we have the same message to both users at which rate we can transmit this message so that both of them uh, are able to decode. Well, this will be the max with respect to the input distribution of the minimum of the two mutual informations. Um, in other words, if you had only one user, the max with respect to px of uh, i uh, of x and, and y is the capacity of the memory channel. Now we have two, and those two have to be driven by the same input, so we cannot separately optimize the two mutual informations, we have to uh, optimize the minimum. And uh, this means that, you know, maybe it turns out that uh, the multicast capacity achieving input distribution is not either the capacity achieving distribution that, uh, that maximizes this one, or then maximize that one, so we are not operating at either the capacity of user 1 or the capacity of user 2, but the multicast capacity, uh, which will be the best rate that is simultaneously achievable by both users. Okay? Um,
So, other simple inner and outer bounds for the broadcast channel are obtained by basically using the same approaches that uh, we have already discussed for the, for the Mac. So the first thing that uh, comes to our mind is time sharing or TDMA. In time sharing, it's always the same story. What is this? What did I do? Okay, it's fine. Hmm? Uh, in time sharing, it's always the same story. We have uh, the individual capacity for user one, which is, of course, the uh, max with respect to px of uh, i, x, and y1 let's say C1, the individual capacity for user 2, same thing for user 2, and then we can, by using time sharing, we get the converse combination of the two, which means you know, we dedicate a certain fraction of time to communicate to user 1, and the uh, complementary fraction of time to communicate uh, to user 2, and therefore the, 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 the region achieved by TDMA is or I mean TDMA or any orthogonal access that uh, divides the transmission resource into a fraction for user one and a fraction for user two is this uh, triangle which is described by this inequality. Okay. Then of course we have the so-called cooperative outer bound, which is very simple. We let the two users cooperate. So we have the transmitter. We have the two users. And now we say, okay, if they can cooperate, well, then these two users operate as a single big user that uh, receives both outputs. And then the rate of this uh, global user is simply the, the um, sum of the two rates, and therefore this will be governed by this by this inequality, and then of course uh, the individual rate inequalities. So we have a region that looks like a little bit like a Mac region, like that. Well, it should be like this, right? And there is a sum rate, and then there is this. So we have um, we have this uh, inner and outer bound. By the way, here I'm dealing only with individual rates. Yeah? So for the moment, we do individual rates only. For two reasons. First of all, it is uh, easier to study the capacity region in two dimensions, so with only R1 and R2, and not in three dimensions, where there is, only, or there is also R0. Second, uh, for the class of channels that we are interested in mostly, which is called the degraded broadcast channels, it turns out that uh, once you have the individual rates, it's very easy to get also the case for, for common rate, because it turns out that in this class of channels, one user can always decode what the other user can decode. So this one user is like better than the other. It can always do what the other do, what the other does. So basically it means that uh, uh, we can take the rate R2 and, uh, and uh, divide it into common and private in any way and this gives the capacity for uh, the individual and common rate for the degraded case. So in other words we get one result for free for this class. So okay, so those are the the two bounds, that uh, inner bound is uh, orthogonal access, outer bound is uh, clearly generally unachievable because it implies that uh, you let the two user cooperate, but in fact this is against the, um, the assumption that the two users decode separately, they are separate users. Um, and so our question is uh, how the capacity region look like? And as I said, this is an open problem, for general uh, broadcast channels, even for the case of discrete memory loss. So we are going first to introduce an achievable region with a new coding scheme called superposition coding. And then, 
see when this achievable region is actually optimal. For, for what class of broadcast channels this, uh, this uh, can be proved. Okay, so uh, this theorem says that a rate pair R1, R2 is achievable for a discrete broadcast channel if it satisfies the following three inequalities for some joint probability distribution PU, Px given U, where, as we can see, U is an auxiliary random variable. So again, for the second time, uh, we see that uh, often in uh, um, multi-user information theory, regions rate regions are given in terms of auxiliary random variables that do not exist in the original problem formulations but somehow uh, represent uh, coding techniques. And we have already seen the emergency of the time-sharing random variable Q for the capacity of the MAC. This is another example, another auxiliary random variable that does not play the role of time sharing, in fact is not always in the conditioning of these mutual informations, is in fact a different thing that we are going to see. So the three inequalities are R1 less than mutual information between X, Y1 given U, R2 less than mutual information U and Y2, and R1 plus R2 less than the mutual information between x and y1. So you see this region is very asymmetric. The role of user 1 and user 2 is pretty different. Okay. Of course, for this region, there is also another region obtained by reverting the roles of user 1 and user 2. And therefore, uh, the achievable region by superposition coding, if we add also the time-sharing uh, opportunities, where we take the union of all these regions of this type, union of all the regions that the uh, union over what? Over, over all possible such distributions. Huh? So you take the union over all uh, uh, these regions, the union of all these re the, the regions that you obtain by reverting the roles of R1, R2, and then you take the convex hull of these two unions because you can do time sharing for between any strategies, and then you have the overall um, achievable region for superposition coding plus time sharing. Yeah? So yeah, I don't know if I have this thing written down. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so this is just to give you a preview of the result. At the end of the day, we take the union over which is um, I don't like this. You should have taken, I mean, I should have written union over this. And then here, I forgot to put here also union over P U, P X given U here. And then you take the converse hall over everything. Mm -hmm. And this is the overall achievable region when we can also do time sharing between between uh, all possible strategies. So in other words, of course, if we show the achievability of rates obeying these inequalities, so if we prove theorem 30, then uh, the achievability of that extended region by including all possible, the union over all possible, reverting the roles and taking convex whole is obvious. Yeah? Um, so we focus on the proof of achievability in this case, which means we are going to construct a family of codes, in fact, to prove the existence of a family of codes using random coding, 
for which if these inequalities are satisfied, then the probability of error uh, vanishes as n goes to infinity. So how the proof works? Well, we fix a joint distribution P u comma x, where u is a new random variable that for the moment we fix. We pick a discrete alphabet. Without loss of generality, we can take uh, you know, a discrete alphabet over the integers 1, 2, 3, 4, up to a certain cardinality, I don't know, capital U. And then we manufacture this uh, joint probability distribution that, of course, can be written as by you know, the usual telescopic rule as PU times PX given U. And then we use the marginal PU to generate a random codebook with 2 to the n R2 code words. And then for every code word in this sort of auxiliary random code book, we generate 2 to the n R1 satellite code words or clouds. So imagine that these the, the code words in the uh, in so this is UN we the code words in in uh, in UN are like a center uh, center clouds and for each sequence in here we generate using uh, this product distribution where we condition on the sequence u of m2 for every message m2 and we generate an auxiliary codebook uh, with 2 to the nr1 codewords. So this is the cloud of points generated by the center cloud. Okay. So at the end, how many codewords x? So this is xn. How many codewords x we have well, for every code word u, we have a whole code book of size 2 to the n r 1 uh, for x. So eventually the number of possible code words x is 2 to the n r 2, number of center cloud points, times 2 to the n r 1 code words for each cloud, okay? And the code words X are indexed by two indices. Index M2 corresponds to the center cloud. Index M1 corresponds to the particular points in the cloud, okay? So we may, we may say, for example, that the index M2 index the cloud and the index M1 index the particular point in the cloud. It's a sort of hierarchical way of constructing a code book. Okay? This coding techniques, uh, technique is called superposition coding. And the reason why it's called superposition coding will be clear when we talk about the Gaussian case. Because right now it's more like a sort of a hierarchical. So you construct a, a code book U and then for every U for every sequence u in the co in the in the first codebook, you you generate an auxiliary uh, codebook x. Mm -hmm. The term superposition will be clear when we go to the Gaussian case because in the Gaussian case we have a much more clear geometric intuition that uh, in fact looks like superposition. Um, okay, so we this is how we generate a random codebook. And then we consider uh, the joint typ typicality decoders at both users, and we analyze the ensemble average error probability using our usual tools. So, uh, receiver two decodes the cloud centers. So it uh, looks for, so it, it receives Y2, it looks uh, in uh, the codebook U 
for the index m2 hat such that there exists uh, the code word u of m2 hat is the unique jointly typical code word with respect to y2. But jointly typical with respect to what? Well, to the jointly typical set induced by the distribution p u comma y2. How do I get this distribution? Well, this distribution is simply obtained by the fact that we have, in general, we have p u p x given u p y 1 y 2 given x. You marginalize, so you sum over all x's and y1, and at the end what you get is this joint distribution eh, by marginalization. And this defines a typical set, and we use the usual typical set decoding. Look over all possible code words if there exists a unique code word jointly typical with the output, and then choose the corresponding index. If this is not found, so either there is no such jointly typical code word or there exists more than one, then pick a random choice or declare error. At this point, it will be irrelevant in terms of error probability. Receiver 1 does something different, does something called interference uh, cancellation and successive decoding, which in a certain sense is similar to what we have already seen uh, for the MAC, uh, for the successive decodable uh, corner points in the MAC region. So receiver 1 first decodes um, Well, actually, no. Sorry about that. Let's, uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me trace back. Receiver 1 simply does join decoding uh, of the messages M1 and 2, but it only cares about M1. So basically, it looks for pairs of messages of the type M2, M1, such that there exists code word UM2, and code word X M1 M2 jointly typical with Y1 according to the typical set U X Y1, which is obtained again by marginalizing summing over Y2 the overall joint distribution. Okay, but it chooses M1 hat if this M1 hat is the unique such message. This is for sum M2. So receiver two does uh, receiver one does not care of whether M2 is unique. There may be more than one, but eventually, as long as it, there is a unique index M1 hat for which this condition is verified for sum M2, then it chooses this M1 hat. Okay. Um, the successive decoding issue will uh, be applied. Uh, will actually, this decoder boils down to successive decoding for the degraded case that we ha I have not mentioned yet. So I was just going a little bit ahead of myself. So um, how the, the, the proof of achievability proceeds now that we have uh, the, the generation of the random code book and we have defined the uh, uh, joint typicality decoders at both users uh, through the usual symmetrization argument we can assume that the messages uh, the, uh, the transmitted messages are 1-1 one, one, and we can consider the uh, underlying distributions of the corresponding sequences input sequences and output sequences so Analyzing the probability of error of decoder 2 is very easy because in the perspective of decoder 2, what we have? Well, we have for decoder 2 simply a channel that goes from U to Y2 with the underlying joint probability PU, PY2 given U. 
Uh, that's a single user channel. And we already know that for this case, the probability of error will go to zero if the rate of message two is less than the mutual information between the input u and the output y2 minus a small delta that vanishes as when epsilon vanishes. So this is a single user result. It follows exactly in the same way as we have proven the uh, achievability uh, for the single user discrete memorized channel. Because it, in a certain sense, we have induced a single user channel by this code construction, we have induced a single user channel between the center cloud code words u and the output y2. And uh, the decoder for user 2 really just look at the joint typicality between u and y2. Hmm? So for user 1, we have to be a bit more careful because we have to study what happens to this joint typicality condition and we have several choices for the, both messages m1 m2 so we have the first case is when m1 is 1 m2 is 1 so they are actually m1 and 2 are the transmitted messages what is the joint distribution of the sequences u x and y1 well when we pick the, the actual transmitted messages, the joint distribution is the distribution with which we have generated those sequences, which is the joint distribution P U X and then P Y 1 given X. So this one. When, remember, remember always what, what, what we are doing here, okay? So it, just to be sure, we have the code book, code book U and those code words are independent, independently generated. The first code word is the transmitted one, okay? And all the others are independent, distributed in the same way, but independent. Then for every code word, we have the auxiliary satellite. And so there will be this, this, okay? And in here, there is the first code word or the first auxiliary code is the transmitted X. All the others are independent. Okay? So, and then of course, we have that this code word is transmitted through the channel and generates Y1. And so we have a joint distribution, which is exactly the one we have used to generate all this, which is that relates uh, u1, x1, 1, 1, which is the first row here, and y1. And then all the other u's are identically distributed as u1, but they are independent of uh of x and, and and y and then all these other uh, x's same so for example if i consider message m1 to be something different from one and m2 something uh, i mean m2 equal to one what we have we are we are considering code words in this auxiliary code book because M2 is 1, so we are considering this row here, and then, but the uh, uh, M1 is different from 1, so the, the other rows in the auxiliary code book corresponding to the first cloud center, those axes are distributed together with the center cloud according to the correct joint distribution, but Y1 is independent of those axes, right? Because y1 is generated by x11, 
these other axes are independent of y1 so when you marginalize everything you find that y1 depends only on you and so we have this probability model then we have the other cases in which we pick uh, m2 is something different from one so we are looking at the other certain uh, center clouds and therefore all the other axes and in this case it turns out that for any choice of m1 again the um, the distribution of x and u is always the joint distribution because uh, for every center cloud we go to the corresponding uh, subcode or um, auxiliary code and therefore uh, for any choice of the indices the way uh, the, the, the sequence x is constructed is always jointly distributed with u but in this case you see that there is absolutely no relation between this x and u and y1 because y1 depends on the first row and the, the first row of the first auxiliary code book uh, and, and therefore y1 is simply we have this product distribution so these are the underlying probability models of uh, all possible pairs of uh, sequences distinguishing whether the indices m1 and 2 are one or not one and then we can uh, look at the error event at uh, user 1 the error event is the union of uh, the following events uh, or at least is it in included in the union of the following events the first event uh, is the event that uh, uh, the selected center cloud for message one and the corresponding auxiliary code word for message one one is not jointly typical with the corresponding output so these are uh, triple u1 uh, x11 and y1 uh, does not uh, is not typical but we know that uh, u1, x11, and y1 are jointly distributed according to the correct uh, joint distribution, and therefore, by the law of large numbers, we already see that uh, the fact that uh, you know a long sequence is generated according to some distribution are not jointly typical. Uh, the probability of this goes to zero. Mm -hmm. Then we have the um, the event one two is. Uh, uh, the probability that <coughs> um, for so u1 x m1 1 and y1 are jointly typical for some m1 different from 1 which means that yes we are in the in, in, in the in the correct um, cloud indexed by u1 but there are some more code words x m11 here that are also jointly typical so the choice of m1 hat is non-unique and therefore we make an error and finally the third event this one is that there exist other pairs of code words with indices M2 and M1 that are also jointly typical for some M1 different from 1 and M2 different from uh, uh, from 1 and therefore we are in this situation sorry this situation notice that I'm not considering this situation because in this case we do not make an error okay but you know we are taking the the union of these events and then uh, uh, use the union bound if we can prove that uh, the probability of each of these events goes to zero then we have that our probability of error goes to zero um, 
So by the law large numbers, the first uh, the first probability uh, uh, goes to zero because uh, we generate u one x one one and y one with the with the uh, correct joint distribution. They are jointly distributed according to the the distribution that defines this typical set, and therefore the probability of finding them uh, non-typical, not jointly typical, goes to zero. For the event uh, E12, um, we notice that um, um, the sequence XM11, when M1 is different from 1, is conditionally independent of Y1, given u uh, because we uh, u1 generates this right but y1 is generated by u1 x and 1 1 y1 okay and this guy is another code word uh. this is the first row this is another row so we have uh, joint distribution of u1 and x m11 according to the probability p u x but the probability of uh, y1 uh, given u well y1 given u is independent of this vector so we have the the, the case uh, if you go back to to the uh, packing lemma, we, uh, we are exactly in that case for which we have a conditioning variable, in this case it's u, that generates, so we have a conditioning variable u that generates x according to a certain distribution and then y according to uh, the, conditional, the, the, the joint distribution uy and this x, which is this code word, is independent of, uh, of y because uh, well, this goes through x1, 1, which is hidden here. So what is the probability that a sequence u, x, y is jointly typical um, when we have this conditional independence? Well, you go back to the, uh, to the packing lemma and you, and you find that the, 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 the probability that this jointly typical is uh, 2 to the minus n times the mutual information of x and y given u minus a small delta then you use the union bound you have 2 to the n r 1 such code word so at the end uh, uh, taking the union bound we, multi we, we add all these probabilities by so we multiply by this and then we ask what is uh, the condition for which this uh, 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 exponential goes to zero when n becomes large and when the exponent is negative and therefore we end up with this condition okay and um, in order to analyze the last error so the last error event is uh, this e13 which was defined here we notice that uh, now u m2 x m1 m2 when both m1 and m2 are different from 1 are independent of y1 and therefore we have the same argument we have that uh, um, we have that uh, now the overall possibilities for the for the for the two indices is now 2 to the n r1 plus r2 and the probability that uh, this uh, sequence, uh, this pair of sequences, uh, u, x, which are jointly distributed according to u, p, u, x, but independent of y1, are jointly typical, uh, is uh, 2 to the minus n, and then the mutual information between u, x1, and y1, minus another small delta. Okay? So again, by letting the, these uh, the condition for which this goes to zero is that the exponent is negative and therefore we end up with this inequality. Okay. Now, last, uh, last um, uh, step 
is simply to recognize that uh, these, uh, these mutual information, u, x, and y1, can be, by the chain rule, can be written as uh, 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 x, y1, and then mutual information of u, y1, given x, but this is 0. Why 0? Because the way we have constructed uh, the, the, the triple uh, u, x, y1 is that uh, we have formed a Markov chain here because we have generated first u, then x given u, and then y1 given x is the chain. Okay? So then this mutual information is zero, and therefore at the end this exponent here is just given in this term. Uh, so the u disappears because of the, the way we have constructed the joint distribution. So this shows that the probability of error, the random coding ensemble average probability of error goes to zero if these inequalities, this inequality, this inequality uh, are satisfied. Uh, and also the other one, the other one for, for user for user two, so that 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 inequality. So this proves the achievability of this region because we have constructed a random coding ensemble and then you know the usual argument of random coding uh, if uh, the probability of error averaged over uh, the ensemble of random codes uh, vanishes there must be a sequence a sequence of deterministic codes for with, with the with the uh, increasing probability uh, block length such that the, also the probability of error is not worse than average and therefore if the average goes to zero this proves the existence of a deterministic sequence of codes for which the probability of error goes to zero as the block length goes to infinity so the conclusion here is that uh, um, um, we can we can uh, symmetrize the region by exchanging the role of uh, decoder one and two. So construct another code with superposition coding exactly in the same way, uh, but simply generating messages. Uh, this, uh, the, uh, the cloud centers uh, for messages for user one and uh, the auxiliary. Uh, code books for to convey messages uh, for user two, and then we take uh, the union of all possible distributions and take the union of these two regions, the convex hull of the union, and this gives an achievable region achieved by superposition code. Very good. So at this point, what we can do is to introduce a class of channels, which is called the degraded broadcast channels, for which super, superposition coding is optimal. So the region that we have just defined turns out to be the capacity region. And uh, in order to do so, we have to be able to prove a converse that is tight. Mm -hmm. So what is degraded broadcast channel? Well, first of all, uh, the graded broadcast channel is essentially a channel for which one user can emulate the output of the other user. So one user is strictly better in the sense that by adding noise to its own output, it produces an output which is statistically equivalent to the output of the other user, which implies that whatever the worst user can decode, also the best user can decode, because it can always fake to be the worst user by simply generating noise locally, say corrupting its signal, then its output will be completely uh, statistically equivalent to the output of the other user, and therefore whatever the other user can do, also the better user can do. So among this class, we, we identify a particular case, which is called physically degraded broadcast channel, which is, I would say, not very practical unless you really have a line with uh, different uh, uh, points 
uh, of, of, of decoding. Uh, a physically degraded broadcast channel uh, is a channel for which the conditional distribution P, Y1, Y2 given X breaks into this Markov chain. So you have a distribution that goes from X to Y1 and another one from Y1 to Y2. In other words, you really have the concatenation of two channels, for example, in this case, a BSC from X to Y1, and the decoder user one is here, and then effectively you take Y1, you put it into another random transformation, so you are degrading Y1 by essentially adding, in this case, binary noise, and you get Y2, okay? Uh, more in general, we talk about stochastically degraded broadcast channels. Stochastically degraded broadcast channels are channels for which um, basically is exactly what I, what I was saying before. The, 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 say user one, in this case, can stochastically emulate the output of user 2. So for example, in this case, when P2 is greater than P1, we can always find an alpha such that P2 is 1 minus alpha P1 plus alpha uh, 1 minus P1, okay? And um, it turns out that uh, this means that uh, user 1 can emulate the output of user 2 by simply taking his output and concatenating it with another binary channel that uh, corrupts its output by alpha. So, uh, in other words, there are channels for which you see in this case, for example, uh, the two outputs are not one in sequence of the other. There is no physical Markov chain from X to Y1, Y1, Y2. But uh, the channel statistics is in a way that we can think of uh, the output Y2 as a physically degraded version of the output of uh, Y1. In this case, you see we have the same P1 from here to here and then from here to here. So these two are statistically equivalent. Whatever this user can do, this hypothetical user can do. And then there is a physical degradation, which is essentially adding noise to get to the output Y2, okay? So this is called a stochastically degraded. And uh, yeah, probably the, the best definition is, uh, it is possible for the better user to stochastically emulate the worst user, uh, which means that he can always pretend to be the worst user. And so whatever the, the worst user can do in terms of decoding, also the better user can do. Okay. Um, so for example, the, the binary symmetric physically degraded channel, we have uh, that uh, y1 will be simply the modulo 2 sum of x and some uh, binary noise and then y2 is uh, the modulo 2 sum of y1 and some extra noise in the stochastically degraded channel we simply have two different noises it doesn't even matter that these two noises are independent as long as they are marginally, Bernoulli, with probably the P1 and probably the P2, and as long as P1 is less than P2, then for the argument of before, well, there is an alpha that uh, for which this can, can be done, right, because you have always that uh, P2 must be a converse combination between P1 and 1 minus P1, because it's an intermediate value, so it means that the user one can basically further corrupt its output by flipping bits with probability alpha and emulate stochastically what user two can do. 
uh, and, and therefore uh, th this is enough to talk about a degraded broadcast channel. And by the way, since the capacity region depends only on the um, conditional uh, marginal distributions of uh, the, the output given the input, we see that for every degraded broadcast channel there is one member in this equivalence class with the same capacity which is stochastically uh, sorry which is physically degraded and it turns out that we, we can prove the converse for the physically degraded channel and this converse then apply to the whole class so this is an important observation because uh, the proof of the converse is done for the physically degraded channel because you know it's simple to treat. We have just one output uh, uh, of the worst user is simply the output of the better user plus additional uh, noise. Or so we get to the result of uh, the capacity region of the degraded broadcast channel that says the degraded broadcast channel with individual messages. So we talk about individual messages only R1, R2. Uh, and the order of degradation is that y2 is the worst user, so y2 is a degraded version of uh, y1, is the convex hull of the union over all possible p, u, p, x given u of the regions obtained by these two inequalities, r1 less or equal than the mutual information x, y1 given u, r2 less or equal than the mutual information uh, u, y2. Mm -hmm. And, interestingly, as, low, as usual, when we, a capacity region is given in terms of auxiliary variables, we have a cardinality bound. So where u is a random variable with the alphabet of size not larger than the minimum of the sizes of the alphabets x, y1, y2, plus 1. So this is a cardinality bound. So the proof of achievability follows directly from what we have already seen by superposition coding. Yeah? The only thing that we have to work out is the fact that uh, here there is one less inequality. Normally we, we would have also the inequality like this. Sorry. Uh, this is x, y1. But this inequality for the degraded broadcast channel turns out to be redundant. Why? Because if the two rates uh, satisfy these two inequalities, then the sum satisfies this inequality. Right? Because r1 is less than this term, r2 is less than this term. But then, we have that uh, because of the degradation, the, the mutual information between u and y2 is less or equal than the mutual information between u and y1 because we have <coughs> the Markov chain u, x, y1, y2, at least in the case of the physically degraded. Hmm? And therefore, the mutual information from here to here is always greater or equal to the mutual information from here to here by the data process inequality. And then, so we have this bound, and then when you, when you put things together here, you have this, but as we have already seen before, because uh, uh, once you condition with respect to x, u and y1 become independent, then this, this reduces to this term. So we see that uh, in the degraded case, these two inequalities imply the third, and therefore there is no need for this inequality here. In general, for the general case, the superposition coding region has this third sum rate inequality, but for the degraded case, this becomes redundant. Okay, so this ends the the uh, the proof because uh, well, we know that this region is achievable by superposition coding, so achievability is proved. Now, uh, the real challenge is to prove the converse, so to show that this region is optimal. So, to prove the converse, 
we look at uh, the as usual we assume that uh, to have a family of broadcast codes with vanishing probability of error and re individual rates R1 and R2 and we are going to uh, try to single letterize the expressions that we get from final inequality knowing that uh, the uh, uniform independent probability over the messages uh, induces the following joint distribution of the messages the input x and the two outputs uh, because the messages are independent so independent and uniformly distributed so it's this then uh, uh, x given the messages is simply the indicator function of the code word corresponding to m1 and 2 notice that here we are not constructing any center clouds nothing the code is given to us so the code is in general a sequence of code words x indexed by the two messages m1 and 2 and then uh, the channel specifies uh, the the distribution of uh, x1 uh, sorry y1 y2 given x uh, is memoryless so we have this product distribution okay so this is the multi-letter underlying distribution obtained by uh, our uh, code of length n and uniform distribution over the messages so final inequality gives us the following for decoder 1, decoder 1 wants message 1 and has y1n. So through the usual argument that uh, the entropy of message 1 given y1n must be less or equal than n epsilon n, because and therefore we can write nr1 equal to the uh, entropy of message 1 plus and minus this conditional entropy plus this minus the same and then this the difference of these two uh, entropies is this mutual information and then this term is uh, n epsilon n so we get this same thing for decoder 2 so we this is the usual starting point obtained by final inequality. So the key point here is to identify the auxiliary random variable. In the case of the MAC, if you remember, the auxiliary random variable came from single letterizing everything and then identifying Q as the time sharing variable. Here we can't. Mm -hmm. So It turns out that uh, there is a magic choice, uh, which is absolutely non-trivial, which is this. The ui is m2 and the past of y1 up to time i minus 1, which is uh, totally non-intuitive. You can't say from now, so we have to see it how it, how it works. Uh? First of all, I mean, the proof is very ingenious and, uh, and is absolutely non-trivial. Non First of all, we start from user 1. So we start with this mutual information. If we add M2 here, well, we can only enlarge mutual information if we add variables in either sides. Huh? Then it turns out that if I use the chain rule here, I have the mutual information of m1 and m2 plus the mutual information of m1 y1 given m2 but since the messages are independent this is zero so we have this equality then I use the chain rule with respect to y1 and I can break this mutual information in this way and you, we see that the conditioning here is exactly what I can call UI okay so then we get to this point at this point because 
and the fact that uh, xi is um, um, no, we can we can add xi here, and uh, therefore enlarging uh, the the bound, and then we use the fact that the channel is uh, memoryless for which y one i the when i condition on the input at time i is independent of uh, everything else, and therefore I have. Uh, the dependency on, on uh, uh, M1 disappears. If you don't believe it, well, you just use the chain rule in the, in the order uh, X, uh, first this and then this, and you see that once, once uh, the XI goes into the conditioning, then the mutual information between M1 and y, Y1I is zero because we have a Markov chain, right? We have uh, XI and then we have. Uh, Y1I and the message stays here. The message M1 is here because of the way the, way the, the, the coding works and the fact that the channel is memoryless, so it doesn't matter. These, of course, influence all the other past and future inputs, but uh, but you know the channel is memoryless. So if you condition on the current input, the current output uh, becomes. Uh, no, if you cut here, there is no dependency. Um, so. So we end up with this uh, uh, expression that again is not yet a, a single letter expression because we are summing over the whole block. So this is the mutual information of these marginal distributions. And we have this strange definition of these we have called it UI. So we have somehow concealed the message two and uh, the the sequence y one up to time i minus one into a single uh, variable that we call u i. Now the trick is that also for user two we can uh, basically enucleate the same uh, auxiliary renum variable because what we have here uh, we we can take. Uh, the other mutual information, the other multilateral mutual information, we can develop it in uh, the in in uh, uh, with respect to y two. Mm -hmm. So this is just the chain rule. Then uh, we can simply uh, use the chain rule in reverse mode, and basically this condition uh, gets here because you know if you break this, uh, you're going to have that this uh, this term is equal to this plus another term, which is a mutual information, so it's not negative. At this point, we can augment this mutual information by adding here something else. Why we want to add here? Because now here we have u, now we have ui. So these are artificially done. We can do it, uh, as I say, as, as long as we uh, put terms inside the mutual information on both sides of the, of the semicolon, we can only increase the mutual information. And since we are uh, looking for upper bounds, we, we can do that. Um, so now, here is the key step. The key step is to recognize that we have uh, among all possible uh, broadcast channels, or among all possible degraded broadcast channels, we are going to choose to prove the converse for the physically degraded channel for which there exists an actual Markov chain X, Y1, Y2. Okay? And this means that um, it means that uh, these. Uh, implies that uh, if we condition on m2 and y1 up to time i minus 1, y2 becomes independent of uh, the past of y2. Mm -hmm. Because, in other words, if let me try to explain this. Uh, you can make a diagram of this type. Imagine that we, we simply represent the, the uh, dependency of the variables over the whole block. So we have the two messages, oopsie, uh, we have the two messages m1 and m2, right? They, through the code, they determine um, all the x's, x1, x2, x3 until 
xn because those x's are all functions of these two messages through the encoding function, right? And then each one of these will determine y1, 1, 1, and then y2, 1. These will determine 1, y, uh, 1 2, and then y2, 2, 2, y1, 3, y2, 3, etc., etc. And this is because we have this physical degradation. We are considering really that uh, there is a random transformation here and that there is a random transformation here. Okay? So we have this sort of dependency graph between the variables for the physically degraded case. Okay? So now look at the following thing. Take here xi, y1i, y2i. This part is y2i minus 1, and this part is y1i minus 1. Now you see that if you cut out so you condition on this. There is no path that goes from here to here, right? Because it, it gets blocked here. So when the conditioning can be seen by, uh, when you fix, uh, you, you have a conditioning, is like cutting this dependency graph here. And then there is no, uh, no relation between these guys uh, and M2 and Y2I. So we have this Markov chain. Hmm? And why we want this Markov chain? Because now this is exactly what we have called uh, uh, UI. Hmm? So we have here our UI, and we can use the, uh, the, the, this Markov chain and the chain rule but, uh, to, to, to say that, okay, these can be written as the mutual information between ui and y2i, and then the mutual information between y2i minus 1 and y2i given ui, but we know that this is 0 uh, because of what we have said before, and therefore this becomes just that. And, you know, by pure luck, or, you know, these ui appearing here, in the inequality for user one is the same that we have manufactured here for user two. Otherwise, this would not be a valid choice. You cannot call in the same way two different things. So putting these things together, we have one inequality for user one, for rate one, and one inequality for rate two. And the last step, is simply again introducing the time sharing variable because now we can see these are empirical averages of mutual information along the marginal distributions induced by the code so we can now uh, define q uniform over over from the integer from 1 to n and then redefine u as Q uh, and U sub Q, X as uh, X sub Q, Y1 in this way, Y2 in this way, and we end up with uh, these uh, inequalities showing that if such code exists, then R1, R2 must satisfy these inequalities for some distribution P, U, P, X given U. P, Y1, Y2, given X, okay, for some. So, as you can see here, the resulting random variable U is very strange. We have uh, defined UI in this very strange way that contains uh, an infinite number of random variables plus messages. Uh, we, uh, and, uh, and then we have put together the time sharing random variable with uh, uh, this u, uh, uh, and, and, and we have, uh, so it's clearly uh, this random variable is, well, we don't, we, 
We have no control on the alphabet of this uh, auxiliary non variable. It's just something that we have somehow created from the proof in the singular iteration process. So it is fundamental to bound the cardinality of the auxiliary uh, random variable alphabet U, and this can be obtained by applying the convex uh, cover method uh, exactly in the way we have already done for the timeshare random variable in the Mac, and maybe I'm going to see this uh, uh, in uh, the live session because, uh, again, this is a little bit technical, uh, and uh, maybe it takes a little bit uh, more time. So we stop here. Uh, so the proof is done up to the cardinality bound. We are going to discuss the cardinality bound live. Um, and, uh, and then for the rest, we were going to, 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 to treat the, the rest of, the, of, of this chapter uh, in the remaining part, in the part two.